Hi, everyone. Hopefully we are live and we are back. We had tech problems today. We just prayed about that before, before our session. So the tech gremlins are here and they are wanting to discourage us. So we're not going to let that happen. But please let us know that we are live. I'm not seeing any comments yet. So let us know that we showed up on live Facebook as well as YouTube. And it might be that you just stopped watching because we weren't live. So let us know that we are live on Facebook. Hello, Nicole. Thank you so much. And it's at a little F yeah. there on Facebook. So yay. It wouldn't let us on on Facebook. It let us on on YouTube, but it wouldn't let us on on Facebook. So we had to shut it down. We had to <clears throat> reprogram the whole thing. Thankfully, I had someone here who can do that because otherwise we would have been <laughs> up a crack. So, so glad you're here. It's Coach Susan is here with us. And today we're talking about over... So I don't know if you're seeing um, Leslie's looks like she is frozen to me. What are you noticing on your end? I can pick up and keep talking if Leslie is frozen, but maybe it's my computer that's frozen. Leslie just froze. Okay, so what she was about to say is we're here um, to talk about breaking the cycle of overworking and self-neglect. Um, so we will be happy to take your questions and keep in mind that this is uh, Leslie's public Facebook page and YouTube is always public. So if this feels sensitive to you, um, I, I want to be uh, I want you to be careful in what you're sharing in the chat, although I love to see the active chat. Hello. Uh, if you have a question for us and you want to send that to us privately. You can go to leslievernick.com forward slash question forward slash. All right. Hopefully, Leslie will pop back on here, um, but I'm just going to keep rolling with it. And I know Howard was watching, so Howard can send me a message in the chat, too, if I need to shut this down and we need to restart. So I just want to engage you, those of you who are here, we have quite a few viewers on Facebook and YouTube. What does that mean to you? Uh, what is that cycle like? Overworking to the point of self-neglect. So let's just kind of look at those terms, overworking and self-neglect. What are your, what thoughts come to your mind as this topic pops up for you? And let me just put that banner up so you can see it. Breaking the cycle of overworking and self-neglect. What's coming up for you? Is this resonating for you? Overworking in the marriage and neglect of myself. Yeah, that's so typical in the population that we usually work with and attract here on Leslie Vernick um, and co. And you know, you're right, is sometimes we get in that place of trying to over function for people to want to fix others to the point where it's starting to harm ourselves. Always putting others first. Cultural approver, approval, absolutely. I need to stop staying up until two doing chores. I'm guessing you're saying, uh, yeah, 2 a.m. and then getting up at six. Yeah, that sounds like overworking, perhaps. So, yeah, I'll just ask you, are you living within your limits or are you always overdrawn? Do you budget your resources according to your values, your priorities, your family needs? Or are you using up those resources in order to live up to other people's expectations or to gain their approval or to perhaps fix their problem? Yeah, it's hard to stay in peace and give with a joyful heart when you're empty. Absolutely. If you're entirely depleted, you're not going to have a lot to give, are you? And it's going to start taking a toll on your body. 
doing so much for family and feeling exhausted and resentful. That's some important information. When your body is telling you you're exhausted and you're resentful, that's uh, some good feedback to let you know that you're not taking care of yourself very well. And you may need to start implementing better self-care, better boundaries, better limits for yourself. Yeah, Brenda, you're saying you do, you might overwork to gain approval. Yeah, thanks for engaging in the chat. And I would love to just kind of tap into what are what is your experience with self-neglect? How do how do you identify with that? Where do you notice that? How could you even draw attention to whether or not that's happening for you? Yeah, Tamara is saying health issues. Absolutely. You may begin to notice some health issues. And I see my question popping up in the chat. Thank you so much. I think we have uh, Amanda helping us today. And I appreciate that. Feeling sad and overwhelmed. Yeah, our feelings can be some great information to help us know what's going on. Stress and anxiety. Yeah. How do you know that you're stressed and feeling anxious? How do you feel that in your body? I'm trying to step back. And when I start to resent it, yes, step back. And those are setting up some boundaries for yourself. Oh, Lori's saying, I don't recognize who I am anymore. Always exhausted physically and emotionally. Headaches and poor sleep. Relationship struggles. Yeah, these are some great indicators. I see Howard popping on. Thanks, Howard, for fi fixing that for us. And Leslie, Hello. welcome back. You're back. You're, you got on and you've been on all this time. That's wonderful. Yes. We've just been talking, Leslie, about uh, the topic. And I've gotten a lot of engagement in the chat about what it's like to overwork and what it feels like. How to even notice self-neglect. Mm-hmm. I'm noticing, I'm so glad that you're noticing. I was talking with Susan earlier today and, you know, I think that we have been, as Christian women, so desirous to be, you know, a worker that need not be ashamed. We're so desirous of healthy relationships. We're so desirous to be connected and belong to a group that we often say yes when we need to say no. We don't use our voice. We don't pay attention and that's what Susan's been helping you do is to pay attention to ways that you are functioning that may not be not only good for you, they may not be good for the people you live with. They may not be good for you to work so hard and neglect yourself. And why might that be? Why might it not be good for them for you to be mm. working so hard? Great question. Yeah. So there's a lot in here of why it's not good for you. Why is it not good for them? Why is it not good for your husband or your parents or your children for you to overfunction and for you to overwork? Why is it not? It's not good for you, but sometimes we do it because it's good for them, but maybe it's not so good for them. Why is it not good for them? Ah, Linda says, I'm less engaged with him. I have no time. Yeah, you're so busy working that you're not having time for a conversation. I think Jesus addressed that with Mary and Martha, right? She was so busy doing, she didn't have a time for a conversation with Jesus. All right. Rachel's saying it's not good for the other person because we need to allow them to work on them more than willing to work on them. Yeah, so if we're, if we're trying to solve their problem more than they're trying to solve their problem, how's that working for you? <laughs> Right? How's that working? Keeps them from being responsible for their life or themselves. Yeah. They don't learn to make changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
so they true. don't get to grow up and become who God called them to be either. Yeah. And I think we can Good kind point. of get this. Let me just text my tech support because I told them to reschedule the appointment. Uh, to hold on, to reschedule the appointment. Hold on. Um, okay. So, um, yeah. And I think we can understand this as moms, Susan, when, when your children were ready to do the next developmental step, you know, whether they were ready to feed themselves or whether they were ready to toilet train or whether they were ready to go to school, <clears throat> you were applauding those natural, hey, I'm going to take the responsibility for this on my shoulders, you know, and even though your kid may not have dressed themselves in the most stylish ways, you might have dressed them, you let them do that, because that's part of what they need to do to take agency and management of their life. Mm -hmm. We're so busy working and overworking to manage everybody else's life problems and life situations. We're not, we're not, Actually, we're saying to them, I don't trust you and I don't have confidence in you to do it yourself. Yeah, I like that visual. Um, you know, when my kids were little, uh, they went to school in England. And so the culture was a little bit different. We, we walked to school and all the kids dressed themselves. They had a uniform, but you could tell the kids dressed themselves. You could tell that they even brushed their own hair right? Because there was a lot of imperfection. And then coming back to the States, I noticed there was a difference. The parents dressed their kids. They were all matching. Their hair was neat and bows and braids. And it just showed me there's some discomfort that happens sometimes for parents mm -hmm. of allowing things to look imperfect. And when, when I, you know, you don't feel okay inside, you try to fix the outside, right? If my child's hair looks all neat and tidy, then I feel okay and I feel settled, right? But to, to be able to tolerate that discomfort of my kid doesn't look okay, <laughs> but I can still feel okay inside because I know that it's empowering them to be themselves, to learn new skills, to brush their own hair, <laughs> but it's hard. Unless we tell ourselves a story that, oh, all the other parents and the teacher's gonna think I'm a bad mom because I don't overfunction and braid my kid's hair in their beautiful braid or that they have tangles in the back of their hair because I didn't brush them or my son's hair is sticking straight up and I didn't tell him to put it down. They're going to think. And so we have this fear of what other people think about us if we're not managing everything in everyone's life perfectly so that we don't create this picture of what? What picture are we trying to create that says we're worth something? Mm -hmm. That says we're good enough, that we're a good enough mom, we're a good enough wife. If we do what? Mm -hmm. If we look together. Yeah. If we meet those standards. Yeah. Yeah, we're very much about appearances. We're obsessed with keeping up with people see on TV, magazines, and social media. And, and that's a, a, it's a, it's a picture, an external picture of what we do internally. How many of you are trying to get your kids or your husband to do something internally too? Like you're pressuring your husband to be a better dad, or you're trying to be the dad that he's not being because he's not being a good dad. So you're trying to be the mom and the dad, and you're overworking to everyone's peril. It's not mm -hmm. just your peril. It's the entire family's peril. And what's the cost to you emotionally? We talked about the cost, I think. Um, physically, what's the cost emotionally? It's exhausting, I think, is a big yeah, part of the cost. Yeah. yeah. Linda, I'm not sure what you mean by your comment. They can't understand what it takes to pull off the dinner of weekend, pull off the dinner of weekend. Of course, children might not understand what it costs uh, or what it takes to pull off a dinner. They're learning. But if, if we take over and then get exhausted or resentful or we've got to be the hero of the dinner for the weekend instead mm -hmm. of saying, hey, how about we just work together? What part do you want to do? What part do you want to do? And if it doesn't come off perfectly, so what? At least you're not exhausted and cranky about it, you know? And so I think those are the lessons that we learn. How do we collaborate? Um, I remember, and you know, I've shared this story before, but I was such an overfunctioner and overworker at the holiday time. I took it all on my shoulders to create a wonderful holiday for everyone because I never had that as a kid. And I just thought that was going to be like, my job to be the mom and create magic at Christmas time. 
But the problem was I was so angry and resentful while I was doing it and so exhausted that mom was cranky at Christmas. And so um, I really had to step back and say, what kind of Christmas do we want to create as a family? What's most important to all of you? Mm -hmm. And the things that I thought were important weren't important at all. I was just trying to make them happen because I thought they were important. And so to really have that conversation, what's really important about a family dinner? Maybe it's not about having a gourmet meal. Maybe it's about ordering a pizza and just all being together. Hmm. You don't get to enjoy our life, Chris says, yeah. Yeah. What else does it cost you? What does it cost you to neglect yourself? What does it cost you to neglect yourself by being so busy doing for others? And we're not just talking about your health. What does it cost you to neglect yourself? Yeah, there's that big cost that somebody mentioned earlier of not being the person God called you to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your focus gets shifted off to something that's not important, not God honoring, not advancing the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It costs you a sense of accomplishment for your self-interest. Yeah. You know, Paul said something very interesting to young Timothy in the book of Timothy, I believe, first Timothy. He said to him, God has given you some gifts. He's given us all some gifts. And then he said this, and so I'm challenging you, fan into flames the gifts God has given you. Who am I? My gifts weren't being used. It costs you your authenticity. It costs you your authenticity. It costs you the ability to like the person you see in the mirror. Yeah, and it costs you, you've, you've never taken the time. You've neglected your gifts. You've never, like I'm working on my art. You know, that's part of the gifts that God gave me. It's not a fully developed gift. God never gives us our gift in our fully developed state. I've written some books and I've had a lot of editors help me because it's a gift that God gave me, but it's not a perfect gift. I had to develop it. So fan into flames the gifts God's given you. But if you're so busy fixing other people's lives, if you're so busy making sure they have what they need and you're neglecting yourself, what you are doing is you're treating yourself as an object. They're just not treating you as an object. You're treating yourself as an object, mm. as in a machine, not as a person. Yeah. So Karen put it in the chat, 2 Timothy 1.6. This is why I remind you to fan into flames. Fan into flames. That's your job to do. About you. If you don't steward you, who does? So I want to invite you to put a, calendar, a date on your calendar. We are going to be doing a free workshop, a webinar. It's going to be off social media, so you have a lot more privacy to share what you want to share. And we are going to be doing it on Thursday, August 17th. And I will put it on the uh, feed that you can sign up for. It's also in the chat. But if you would like to um, be a part of this workshop, the workshop is called this. I'm not okay when you're not okay. In other words, that's why we start over-functioning. That's why we start doing so much. Because we're not okay with chaos. We're not okay when someone doesn't get their work done. We're not okay when they're watching porn. We're not okay when they're dishonest. We're not okay when they don't love us like we want them to. All of the things that they don't do that we want them to do affects us. And so our go-to strategy is to try to fix them mm -hmm. so that we feel better. And how's that working? Mm -hmm. How's that working? That's one reason why we work so hard and neglect ourselves is we're trying to fix them or stop them or change them so we aren't feeling the way we feel. So we're feeling okay. Right? That's why we brush our kids' hair, because if you don't look okay, I don't feel okay as a mom. So if I fix your hair, then I feel okay as a mom. That means I'm a good mom, right? And so if this is you, I would really encourage you 
We spend some time on Facebook Live, but it's not the same as really digging deep. I'm going to spend about, and I always say 60 minutes, but I'm going to be more honest. We're going to probably <laughs> spend about 75 to 80 minutes teaching you very specific things about how to get out of this rut, how to get out of trying to fix his problem. And the way we do that is by clarifying things. What is his problem or your child's problem or your adult parent's problem or your husband's problem? Maybe it's serious. He's having an affair. He's watching porn. He's addicted to gambling or other, another substance. It's a serious problem. He's abusive. What's your problem? You're scared. You're getting unhealthy. You're financially destitute because of his gambling addiction. You're not sure what's happening with your kids in their private time with their dad. And that feels scary. That's your problem. And then what's the marriage problem? And so we're going to tease all that out in the workshop. I'm going to show you how to figure that out so that you can work on the only problem you have any power to solve. And that's your problem. But the truth is people do influence us. So when they're not okay, we're not okay. I get that. I'm not okay either. Like, you know, when things aren't okay on the external, we tend to get impacted by that. Even this morning when Facebook didn't connect and I wasn't mm -hmm. having internet, I got a little anxious. I got a little irritable, right? It happens to all of us. But what do we do with it? What's my problem is I can't fix the internet. You know, I, I don't even know the tech, technology to fix what you can do, but I can work on my problem, which is I get anxious. How do I calm down? How do I calm myself? Mm -hmm. So I can still function talking to you, right? Those are my jobs to do. And so I'm going to teach you how to do that. I'm going to give you the four-step process of learning to build some strength internally so that you aren't so frazzled as easily when your external world has problems in it, whether they're your husband's problems, your children's problems, or political problems, it doesn't throw you for a loop as easily. And I will teach you that. And then I will open it up for Q&A that's in a private space off social media so that you're more free to talk. And oftentimes these sessions last about three hours. So mm -hmm. they're very rich. They're very valuable. They're very um, helpful. You'll get a workbook to use. And I really encourage you to sign up, but you don't get invited I'm inviting you now, but you don't actually don't get an invitation to come to the workshop unless you sign up because we don't want to bother people in their emails. I don't even have your email. And so you have to sign up so I can say, hey, the webinar is here. Here's the workbook and here's the link to go to our private place and sign up and, and attend the wor workshop. And so I can't do that if I don't have a way to contact you. So if you're interested in this, if you think it would be helpful for you, um, it's an intensive. It's an intensive mm -hmm noon Eastern time. And then we do the whole thing again, 7.30 PM Eastern time. And I am live each time teaching and the Q and A. Um, people often ask if there's a recording of it. Yes. You don't get the recording if you don't sign up because we can't email it to you anywhere if we don't know your email. All right. However, let me tell you the benefit of attending live. And I would just encourage you. I mean, if this is really for you and this is important to you, you might need to just Say, hey, I'm not going to neglect myself here. I'm going to show up. I'm going to show up and I'm going to be all in. I'm going to have my pen. I'm going to have my download my workbook. I am going to pay attention. I'm not going to have distractions. I'm not going to schedule other things that I have to do during the workshop. I'm going to be present. And I am going to take this hour, hour and a half, two hours if I stay for the Q&A or three hours if it goes that long. And I am going to take what I need to do to help me grow to help me heal, to help clarify things in my mind. Because if you just watch the replay, this is what you're not going to get in the replay. When we're together as a group, just like we're here right now in Facebook, and you're seeing everybody else's chat, that's really helpful for you. You're not alone. You're not alone with this problem. That de-shames it right away. Like, oh, everybody else has this problem too. I'm not the weirdo. I'm not the one who's, you know, defective. Lots of women have this problem. And that's really helpful to know you are not alone. Also, there's a lot of great ideas in the chat. And you see some women who are a little further along the journey than you. So we do have a live chat going in the workshop. Our coaches are all on the live chat answering questions as we go, as you're listening. You don't get that in the replay because we don't want to share your personal private information that you shared on the chat to everybody who didn't attend the workshop, you shared it in the workshop. That's fine. It's off social media. That gets closed down and that never gets shown again, right? But that's why it's good to be live. And then the Q&A time. 
lots of clarification, lots of questions about your issues that you can ask that you can't probably ask on my public Facebook page um, that you can ask, how do I deal with it? What's his problem? What's my problem? How do I deal with my problem when he keeps cheating on me or when I'm scared of him or I can't speak up because he hits mm-hmm. me? All of the kind of things that we talk about in our groups. You can't put that on Facebook, but you can talk about it in our private webinar space. And so coming live gives you so much more If you wanted to call me and have a consultation with me, you would spend a lot of money because I just don't have the time to do one-on-one consultations with someone. But I am gifting you this. All this information, all this time, your ability to ask questions of me, show up, do that for yourself. And if you know someone else who might be helped by this, give them the link to sign up as well. And again, if you can't make it, life happens, I understand you will get a replay, but it's just not the same experience. Mm-hmm. Life. So I'm going to stop with that. We're going to move on to answering some of your questions that you might have or any other things. I want you to know that when we are treating ourselves like a machine and we're just functioning and functioning and functioning and over-functioning and working to solve someone else's problems and working to fix their life and completely neglecting our own, it costs us and it costs us in big ways. And you know that it's in the chat. And so understand you have choices. You don't have to live life that way. You can do it differently. And if you don't know how, then attend the workshop because that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Uh, Let's see, there's a question here right on the chat. My husband has agreed to counseling and has been more open and vulnerable with me than I've ever known him to be. It's what I prayed for. But what do I do with the information he's sharing with me? It's heavy stuff. I want to be sure I'm taking care of me emotionally and still be present for him. I want to be sure I don't overfunction as I have in the past, that I've not allowed room for God to move. Ashley, Mm -hmm. I love this question. I think this is so heartfelt and genuine. And here's, here's a shift that I really want you to make. And Susan, I want you to chime in on this too. I want you to be there for him and I want him to learn to be there for you. If you're going to have a real relationship repair and you're going to really create the marriage that you want and hopefully he wants, then he has to make some changes, not in just what he doesn't do anymore, whatever that is. And please don't tell us on this Facebook live (laughs) on this public Facebook page. He has to make some changes and stop doing what he has done in the past, but he also has to make some changes and start doing something different. Right. And so I think it'd be really empowering for you to say, I really want to be here for you. And I also really want you to be here for me. And when the information is just too much for me, or I just can't tend to you because I'm drowning my own self, Mm -hmm. I need you to understand that and care for me. See, marriage isn't just about you caring for him and helping him and being there for him and solving his problems and being faithful to him. It's about mutuality. It's about reciprocity. And so I do think that this is a perfect opportunity for you to be the best self you can be, as compassionate and loving as you can, and also say, I can't carry this burden that long. I can't have any more information right now. I'm full. I have to process the information I have right now. So you can tell our counselor or the pastor, whoever you're talking to, but right now I need to get some support because I feel like I'm up to my eyeballs in what you've done. And I've got to take time to process that. So if Mm -hmm. you hear that and you can't say that, then you're still in a place of unhealth, right? And so this is the part of recreating your opportunity to create the marriage you want. And so start by taking some chances and saying what I want. I want a break. I want some space. I need to process. Maybe you need a separate support group or counselor for you to process all this emotion, right? And if he can also support you in this, that tells you something. Mm -hmm. I love that answer, Leslie. And um, I would just, add to that I I think you're you're noticing something and I think that's the beginning of change being aware of this desire to overfunction, this pattern you've had and now you're pausing to say I want to do it differently 
Mm -hmm. I want to make a different choice this time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Leslie's giving you, given you some great uh, direction on what to do differently this time. And I would say, you know, you can validate his feelings, but also notice your own and really check in with your own thoughts, uh, observing what he's saying to you without absorbing it to make it, make it mean something about you. I know as women, we can sometimes interpret our husband, be, his behavior as meaning something about us. We're not worthy. We weren't good enough. Um, and so really being mindful of how you're thinking about it. This, his actions say a lot about him. They don't say anything about you. Um, and so that's just a little bit of how you can take care of your own thoughts and process your own feelings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and get the support if you need it, you know, the extra Absolutely. support if can't give it to you or the marriage helper, whoever's helping you do this or however he's learning to process his stuff. Um, you may have to learn how to process your stuff too. And, and together learn to create something new. You know, I'm, I'm teaching a class for counselors in September at the American Association of Christian Counselors. And I've been practicing or not practicing, but preparing a lot for how I want to say what I want to say to counselors to do it differently. And this is the word picture. I don't know if I'll use it for, for the counseling uh, staff when I actually get there, but this is the one that's come to me right now is if your husband burns your house down because he is smoking in bed and your house is burned to the ground, mm -hmm. you can spend a lot of time focusing on what he did wrong, right? You can spend a ton of time on whose fault it is. And there is some truth to what he did wrong and whose fault it is. The questions you have to ask yourself is first, do you want to rebuild your house? And second, if you do, what kind of house do you want to rebuild? And so that's kind of the, the thing I would ask you. Your husband's burned down your marriage. Do you want to rebuild it? And if you do, this is the perfect time to speak up. Use your voice. We talked about that yesterday. What kind of marriage do you want to rebuild? Because if the kind of marriage he wants is completely different than the kind of marriage you want, that may be something you have to really think about, whether you want to say yes to that. And that leads to this question right now in our chat. How do I respond when my husband says he uses the Bible to tell me that it's my job as a godly wife to help him with everything. So his idea of marriage, the kind of marriage he wants, is he wants a wife who totally revolves herself around helping him like a servant, mm -hmm. right? A servant's job is to have no life of their own other than serving and pleasing the master. And so in his mind, that's what marriage is. My wife is here to do whatever I want or need to help me do whatever I want and need. And there's a bit of truth to that, that you're a helpmate, but it's mutual. It's a partnership. It's not that you help him and he doesn't help you, that you support him, but he doesn't support you. And part of your job as a helpmate is to speak the truth in love to him, right? So to be able to say to him, I don't disagree totally with you that my job is your helpmate. And so part of my role as a helpmate is to be honest with you. And your view of me in our marriage feels like I'm just a slave to you. Mm -hmm. I'm at your bidding, that I'm an object to use when you need help, when you need sex, when you need food, when you need laundry done. I'm more than that. I am a woman, a person, to love. I am an image bearer. I am your partner. I am not your slave. What might be possible if you had the nerve to say that to him in a kind, gracious way? What might God do in his heart if you weren't afraid to speak the truth in love? Now, he might not like it, so I get it, because some mm -hmm. men don't want a partner. They do want a slave. And that's what they think your role is. And you probably aren't going to change your mind. So then you have to decide. How do you want to show up? 
because you're not a slave. That's not who God says you are. Even if your husband thinks that's what you should be, doesn't make it true. Doesn't make it true. He is not the final authority on who you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would just add to that, I think you need to be clear on what does the Bible say to you? What is God um, telling you to do as a wife? And getting clear on that because uh, you can disagree with him. I don't read my Bible that way. Yeah. I don't hear God speaking to me in that way. Mm -hmm. But until you're really clear on what is God calling you to do as a wife, I don't think you'll be able to say that. And so uh, Leslie is very wise in scripture and I listen to her often, but I think we have to do our own work, our own work with God, our own work being in the scripture to really know what is God telling me specifically? I second that. And one of my goals, and we, Susan and I were just talking about this prior to our Facebook live. One of my goals is I see, and I, I, I see, I, I'm going to exaggerate this. Okay. So I'm older now, but I was raised and I was groomed in the church to defer to male leadership, that male leadership had the answers, whether it was my husband, my pastor, you know, the person who wrote the book, John MacArthur, Ryrie Study Bible, whoever, that I was to defer to leadership, that I wasn't capable enough to think for myself. I don't believe that anymore. In fact, I think God calls us to think for ourselves. He calls us to discern and to develop discernment and wisdom and judgment, and that we are to rightly divide the word of truth knowing what's good and what's evil because evil often masquerades as good. We're to learn that. And nobody can do that for you but you. I can say something. Your pastor can say something. Susan can say something. Ultimately, if you depend on other people to tell you what true is, you're going to be living in confusion land because there are lots of different opinions on what's true. So Susan is absolutely right. It is your responsibility and your privilege to consult the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and he says, and Jesus says, I am giving you the Holy Spirit who will instruct you in all truth. And it's okay for you to think differently than your husband and even your pastor. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. What does that sound like to you? To be responsible, accountable. God's gonna hold you accountable. So what's it feel like to you to be responsible and accountable for thinking for yourself, for discerning what the scriptures are saying, for listening to God's still small voice instead of all these external voices that are telling you what to do. What's that feel like for you? Scary. Scary. <laughs> you captured it, Lynn. You absolutely yeah. did. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a responsibility and it's freeing. Damn, mm -hmm. It's freeing. Yes. We are not to be robotic in our faith, in our interactions with others. Just because you tell me doesn't make it so. And I think that's never more important than now. We live in a culture that we're getting told all kinds of stuff that doesn't sit well with my spirit, right? And just because you tell me, whether it's from the pulpit or from Fox News or CNN News or some other news broadcaster doesn't make it so. And I'm going to have to talk to God about this and see where I'm at in this with the scriptures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. More confident. More confident. Yeah. Yeah. Yesterday we talked about an experience that I had when I really began to have my voice, which wasn't until I was older. And, and my pastor was speaking about Psalm, um, I think, 51, where David is confessing his sin. And you know, it, it wasn't really about David and Bathsheba. It was about David's adultery with Bathsheba. So it wasn't a whole thing about their relationship. But it just taught, he, you know, he's, he's talking about David's adultery with Bathsheba. And he was confessing his sin there. And that was what he was preaching on. And afterwards, I went up to him and I used my voice. And I said to him, do you really think David and Bathsheba had an affair? Do you think she really had a choice? And... He looked at me like, <laughs> not how dare you say that to me, but like, he looked at me like, I never thought of that before. Mm -hmm. God uses women to speak into men because we see things from a different angle than they do. 
if we're afraid to use our voice or we're never thinking for ourselves, as I read that scripture, it's just clear what happened. And yet all these men who interpreted the Bible always interpreted the other way. Maybe because that's how they would see it. Mm -hmm. It might not be how it is. But if women aren't allowed to read the Bible, if they're not supposed to read the Bible, if they're not allowed to go to seminary, if they're not supposed to be theologically sound or, or wise, then why should we listen to them? And when you have that point of view, you can understand that. But I believe God does call each of us to have an account for our lives. And that includes how we believe and what we believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I found my family never appreciated any of it. I definitely could have used this advice 35 years ago. I should have expected my ex to step up. I overcompensated for him. Yeah, I, I, we all do. <laughs> we, have, we have all, you know, been groomed in some of that cultural way. And Michelle, I'm so glad that you're waking up now. I'm so glad that you're waking up now. Yeah. Go ahead. I, my but I was just going to say, when we know better, we can do better. Yes. Right? And so we can't hang in the past where when we didn't know things, but now you're learning something different. You're having new experiences that can move you forward to a different mm -hmm. kind of life. What will you do with that? Mm -hmm. All right. Here's a question. How do I juggle taking care of my granddaughter needs that I'm raising and take care of myself? I'm having headaches, stress, etc. Also going through, um, don't know if there's time for more like self-care. I wasn't sure what, what that uh, abbreviation was. When she has so many needs, when your day is so full of work, appointments, I need to find that balance. Help, please. I'm not trying to fix her. I'm just getting her where she needs to be for appointments. Oh, she's also going through a divorce. And school is getting ready to start. Thank you, Leslie and Susan. Um, I don't know how old your granddaughter is. Um, so you're going through the divorce or your granddaughter is going through the divorce. I'm not sure about that. Um, but you know that phrase, put your own oxygen mask on first. You know, you know why they tell you that? It's not so you live and they die. <laughs> That's not why. It's, did you read about that plane that they lost oxygen and within 20 seconds, pilot conked out? And he didn't even know that he was losing oxygen. So the pilot conked out. And guess what happened when the pilot conked out? Everybody else in the plane died, right? And so when you're losing oxygen that fast, if you take those 20 seconds to put the oxygen mask on someone else before you put it on yourself, you can't help anybody. You can't help anybody. So they tell you to put your own oxygen mask on first so that you don't conk out and become unable to help your children put their oxygen mask on. And so it's not that you, I, it's such a, such a burden and a privilege to have to raise a child that's your grandchild. And we're older, I would find it exhausting and I would have headaches too. So I totally understand that this is, this is a stressor that feels um, unbelievably big. And if you're the one who's going through, through the divorce, it may not be that your husband's there to help you as well. But are there other resources available for you in the community that can also mm -hmm. help you with the burden of her needs and her care? And I don't know what special needs she might have or what medical issues or psychological issues or how old she is, how much she can do on her own. So I don't know any of those kind of things, but you can't help her if you fall apart, if you get sick, if you die. And so the priority is really to say, I love you. And I will do what I can, but I do need to take care of me so I can take care of you. And you have to really have that in your mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a little bit of extra information, Leslie. She's 15 years old, has a lot of mental health issues, uh, multiple psych hospitalizations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so she does have a lot of needs, right? Children have a lot of needs, yeah. but I think you need to tune into yours as well. And as Leslie suggested, getting extra support and starting to tease apart what can, what sort of things can she do for herself and what do you need help with? But I think in, in not neglecting yourself, of giving yourself good self-care, you're gonna be teaching your granddaughter some great skills that it sounds like she needs to know, right? If she's having a lot of mental health challenges, she's gonna to need to know what does it look like to have healthy boundaries with yourself? What does it look like to take care of yourself well? And I think you'll be doing her a greater service if you practice that and allow her to witness it, even if she doesn't like it at the age of 15. 
Absolutely. And I think sometimes, you know, in our system right now, people who have multiple, multiple mental health diagnoses are treated as if they're incapable, that they're not competent, that they're, that they're broken. And I think requiring some things of her, like I need you to care about me too, that reciprocity, mm -hmm. that, that I need eight hours sleep. And when you keep coming in the middle of the night, I can't be wake enough to, to drive you the next day. I need you to let's make a plan for you safety if you're waking, whatever, so that she has some boundaries and some ways that she can take care of herself when she gets distressed, that she's not becoming overly dependent on you to fix her problems. Ultimately, she's 15. She's, if she were two, that'd be different. But she's 15, so she's going to have to start moving into some adult responsibilities. And for someone who feels defective, incapable, and powerless, this can be part of her healing. It's not like you're putting burdens on her. You're actually saying, I have confidence that you can do this. Mm -hmm. I believe in you. You have what it takes to, you know, write this down instead of calling me or texting me every 15 minutes, or you have the ability to read a chapter in this book and then think about it and journal about it and then come talk to me about it so that you're giving her some structure or her counselor is giving her some structure. I'd also see if you could get a youth pastor or a youth pastor's family to be also um, engaged in her well-being and, and give you some relief that way, or, you know, some people in the church that can give you some relief that way, but it's, it's hard. And so I, here's where I would just say, you have to decide you cannot, and this is going to sound harsh, but it's true. You cannot be the hero of her story as much as you want to help her. The best way you can help her is to empower her to be the hero of her story. And there are lots of kids who've had horrible pasts and horrible lives who have become the hero of their story and made great things out of their lives. She can too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great advice. All right. My husband has agreed to counseling and has been more, oh, we already did that one. Okay, let's see. How can I learn to set boundaries when my husband wants to remain living in another state with his adult son and he still wants us to be married? What might your boundary be, Susan, if your husband wanted to live in another state or wanted to be married? I think I would say that doesn't work for me. Yeah. Know your limits, I think, is what Leslie is asking. What are your limits? And we can't answer that. I can't answer it. Leslie can't answer it. What are your limits with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I love the statement, my husband wants, my husband wants, my husband wants. Good for him that he can tell you what he wants. Can you tell him what you want? Mm-hmm. Right. Because that's what a marriage is like. Like it's mutual. It's reciprocal. And so he's telling you, hey, I want to stay here and I want to do this, but I still want to be married to you. What do you want? I don't want that. I want a marriage where we're living in the same house and we share a bed and we share finance, whatever. So I think it's important to talk about what you both want, not just what he wants. And I think this is where women tend to be you know, it's not about being selfish. It's about being honest. This is what I want. This is what I don't want. That doesn't mean I always get everything I want. But if I don't even know what I want, or I don't express what I want, what's the likelihood of me getting what I want? Zero. Mm -hmm. Zero. So that would be a start. It wouldn't be a boundary, but it would just be an expression of, I want something different for a marriage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if you live that life of never getting what you want, because you never use your voice, it leads to a life of helplessness and hopelessness. And it tears you down. Yeah. And then you're not being the person, the wife, the woman that you want to be, even though you're still married. And does that honor God? Right. So I'm going to go back to that question where the man said, your job is to, you know, and I think we have allowed that to be our Bible, that that's who tells us what to do. Oh, he wants that, so I have to do it. He says this, I have to believe it. And I'm saying to you, ladies, that's not true or biblical. 
Abigail in the Old Testament, who was married to Nabal, who was a foolish and surly man, knew full well who he was. And she didn't always listen to him. And she was singled out in scripture and commended for a time that she actually didn't listen to her husband. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I think it's really important that we, as women and wives, love our husbands, love them well, but it doesn't mean enabling their dysfunction or the, the spiritual bullying or the lies that they believe to just go unchallenged. Right. If I'm thinking some lies about my life or myself or what God's going to do, I hope someone would say, Leslie, I, I think you're off and you're thinking. If my husband says some things that I think are off, I'm going to tell him. And if I think some things are off, he's going to tell me. Oftentimes when I write my blog, he'll say, I'm not, I don't think this is right. And I will mm-hmm. adjust that because that's what we're, we have the freedom to do that with one another. So why don't you try and see what happens? So I don't, I don't, I don't think that works for me. That's not the kind of marriage I'd like to have. Yeah. And um, is it Soraya? is saying, when I talk about my needs, he doesn't seem to hear me. Mm-hmm. And I'm waiting for him to act on it. And sometimes this is true, right? You can use your voice and you can speak up and people don't listen. And sometimes mm-hmm. they don't care. And so what are you going to do about that? Mm-hmm. What will you do to make sure that your needs are imp- important enough that you act on them? Right. That you That's hear yourself. To you. Right. Yeah. Even if they're not important to him, are they important to you? Yes. Right. And I think this, this, this tells you something. That when you act like your needs don't matter, that only his needs matter, he starts to believe that. Right? And so let's say you get married and maybe he does want to be a good husband and he does want to do the right thing. I don't know. And, and this relationship starts and you're over-functioning and you're overworking and you're saying, no, no, that's okay. We can do it. And yeah. I'll do it your way. And it's okay. And so he's getting more and more entitled to believe that that's what you do. And that's what wives do. And that's how marriage is supposed to be, especially if his own family of origin functioned that way or yours did too. And then when you start rocking the boat and saying, wait a minute, I don't like this way. He's like, what's wrong with you? You're like, what's wrong with me? Maybe nothing other than some wrong beliefs. And so understand that when you start trying to write that boat, they're going to be like, wait a minute. (laughs) I like it this way. I like having no responsibility and just telling you what you need to do to make me happy and not having to give back. I mean, who wouldn't like that kind of arrangement for some, I'd like to have someone who just waited on me hand and foot and I didn't have to do anything back until I didn't. Right. Mm -hmm. And so understand that there's a, there's a payoff for both of you in that dysfunction. And so you don't have to be, Hey, you're just lazy and selfish and I'm not doing, you don't have to go there. You can say, Hey, I realize that I have misunderstood my role in marriage. I thought my role in marriage was to be a good wife, meaning a non-person that I was to just be whatever you wanted me to be and do whatever you wanted me to do in order to make you happy. And I don't think that's what God calls me to do at all. And I also believe that I've enabled you to kind of be selfish and not think about me. And that's not okay either. So I'm kind of telling you right now, I'm not willing to do life that way anymore. And I'm going to make some changes. So now I'm taking responsibility for me. And we're going to unpack how to do this all in the workshop. But I'm taking responsibility for me and my needs. And if my needs are, hey, I need more downtime or I need to sleep and you're not willing to wear a CPAP machine and I can't sleep with you snoring and you don't seem to care about my needs, then I need to care about my needs and I'm going to go sleep in the guest room, right? Or I'm going to go sleep on the couch or I'm going to go make a bed and blow up mattress and, you know, somewhere else so that I can sleep because I need to sleep and you don't care about that, but I care about that. Great example. All right. My husband has PTSD. I'm in counseling to do my work. My husband is trying. It's like two steps forward, three steps back. I do not feel close or endeared to him. Will this get better? I am sad for both of us. (laughs) Will this get better? I don't think anybody can predict. Will this get better? Um, But I would hope 
as you continue to do your work, you're going to feel better. I don't know what's going to happen in the relationship. Um, so you're just one person in the relationship. And if he doesn't continue to be consistent and persistent in his work, it may not get better in the relationship. But I have full confidence that if you're doing your work, you will begin to feel better. Mm -hmm. And wiser and more clear. And I think that's, that's really important. Yeah. I believed my ex-husband and boys were acts of service. How do you see the difference in overing slavery and serving? Um, I'll, I'll start with that. And then Susan, you might have some ideas. So I love serving people. I'm serving you right now, aren't I? I'm giving you my time. I'm hanging out with you. I'm serving a need. And I, and I love to do that. I love making a big Thanksgiving dinner for my family. I love buying special presents for people when I know I see something. I hate buying presents at Christmas if I don't know what somebody wants. But if I see something in some place that I know this person would love, I love doing that. So that's who I am. That's what I want to do. I don't want to be told I have to do something for someone. I owe it to them. I don't want to feel pressured or guilt tripped or shamed if I say no. So serving is a voluntary position. Jesus laid down his life, chose to do it. Nobody told him to, he chose to do it, right? There were times when people tried to take his life and he fled, he fled. Jesus laid down his life. So choice is a big difference. So slaves don't have choices. Mm -hmm. Slaves don't have voices. Slaves can't say no. Serve, if I serve and I say, hey, I'm happy to serve you and now I can't do this this year because I'm not feeling well or I'm traveling or I'm tired, I'm okay with saying no. I don't feel guilty. Somebody else might not be okay, but I'm okay. So I think that's the difference that I would see. And overing is I'm doing it out of my fear. So we're going to talk in the wor workshop about love-based fear. Like I'm afraid that if I don't help you with your homework, you're going to get a bad grade. I'm afraid that if I don't, um, you know, just keep my mouth shut, you're not going to love me. And so I'm doing things out of fear. I'm calling it love. I'm giving, I'm serving, I'm sacrificing, but it's not like I'm It's not freedom. It's not out of freedom. It's out of fear, mm -hmm. fear of guilt, fear of God being mad at me, fear of you being mad at me, fear of you be disappointed. In me. That's not genuine love, right? Nor is it genuine service, right? can only give someone something that you can get freely right with no no expectations that you do it back or you know you just give it because you want to give it and you serve because you want to serve when there's a agenda attached now you have to do this for me or now I expect this or I have to do this because I'm afraid if I don't you'll fall apart you won't make it you'll get a bad grade you won't love me you you know will criticize me well then that's not that's the difference. That's how I would see it. What do you see it, Susan? Mm -hmm. No, I think you did a great job of um, defining those um, and what's underneath each one of those. But I would take it a bit further. What is the result of each of those as well? Mm -hmm. um, the result of serving is usually joy, mm -hmm. right? It's pleasure in doing that. Mm -hmm. The result of over-functioning for somebody is oftentimes resentment. And the, the result of being a slave to someone is uh, hopelessness, helplessness, worthlessness, powerlessness, powerlessness. Yeah. And so tapping into your body is so important. What information is your body giving you to let you know which category you might be in? Yeah, really good. Yeah. And, and, and there's times, you know, if I feel like I can't give the time, it's okay for me to say no, but if I'm feeling resentful for giving the time, that's important to pay attention to for me, right? And for you. Thank you, Susan, that's really important. Um, let's see, there's a couple of long questions here. My husband has been in recovery from a struggle with porn that he's had for 16 years, starting before we were married. This is his second time in recovery. Both times I've had to put my foot down in order for him to seek any kind of significant help. My greatest concern was the way he treats our young teenage sons. He always struggled to treat them well. His own father was a pastor. 
often preoccupied, so there's a lack of examples, among other things, at play. He's done a lot of work, but there have been times when I've had to ask him to reevaluate because he's slacking off. He doesn't seem to have a lot of internal motivation for anything and often only does things for a short period of time. He gets overwhelmed, shuts down. He can easily get lost in the world of gaming as a coping mechanism. After a year of some pretty significant work with men in the battle and a personal counselor, the addiction issues are better, but I'm still seeing a lack of self-motivation and investment as well as critical and controlling behaviors toward our son. I'm scared that too much of his motivation was mine and I don't know where to go from here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just, uh, so there's a lot about him, his lack of motivation. And I would just ask you to redirect for a minute to what is your problem with his problem? Yeah. He's not okay, but also I'm hearing you're not okay. What problem are you having with that? What's the result of that for you? And that may give you some direction. Where do you go? How do you uphold boundaries for yourself so that you don't have a problem anymore? How do you fix your own problem rather than focusing on what his problem is? Right. And it seems to me like you're trying to make him into somebody he has no motivation to be. Mm -hmm. Right. That You're working really hard at him being a good dad. He doesn't seem to want to be a good dad. You're working really hard at him being an honest, faithful man. He could, meh, meh, you know, being responsible with his time. And it, right now it seems like comfort and pleasure are his main, main drivers, right? Not being, you know, being comfortable and comforted and, you know, pleasure with sex or gaming or whatever. And that's it. It doesn't seem like he's wanting to be the kind of man you want him to be right? And as much as you love someone, I mean, picture you love someone who's diabetic or you love someone who's, you know, needs to lose some weight because they're, you know, huffing and puffing and they can't go up the stairs and they can't do a lot of things. And as much as you love them and you might say, I'll cook for you, I'll, I'll shop for you, I'll do everything you can to help you eat right. And they don't want to. <laughs> you cannot make them do what you want them to do. Um, and so, I think Susan is very right to say, what's my problem? I'm getting discouraged. I'm getting frustrated. I'm getting angry. I'm lonely. I'm, um, uh, you know, I'm scared for my son. Okay. Those are things you can work on, but for you to put all your energy trying to keep him steady on fixing his problem might be very frustrating. Mm -hmm. But it's a big energy output right? That is, is not going anywhere. And you're noticing it's not going anywhere. So where could you put that energy that might uh, result in some relief for yourself? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And some support. Kelsey's asking a follow-up question to that on this topic. When they insist they are trying as hard as they can, what is the right response? Um, I think that perhaps the right response would be another question. And that is, okay, I, I, I want to believe that. So tell me the kind of person you want to be. What, where are you going with this? What, it, it, at the end of the day, when you get there, what, what kind of man do you want to be? Right? Because we get there, like if I really want to be a healthy person physically, then I know that if I eat this whipped cream cake, or if I drink this wine, or I drink this Diet Coke, those are all not in alignment with me wanting to be a really healthy person. Right? So I think kind of declaring where I'm going, just like if I'm going to California, and I'm driving south, that's not going to get me there. And I can be driving as hard as I can, but I'm still not going to get there. Mm -hmm. So I think to ask him, okay, maybe Maybe I'm trying to make you into someone you don't want to be. What, what's all this effort? If you were at the end of the day, you did all your hard work and you got there, where would you be? What kind of person do you want to be? And that's what I'm going to ask you ladies to think about for yourself too. At the end of the day, and, and you know, my, my daughter was saying, mom, you're talking so much about the end of the day lately. And I said, well, I think when you get this age, you sort of think about the end of the day a lot more, you know, that the end of the day, at the end of your life, what will you feel good about? What will you feel proud about? What will you want said about you at your funeral? That, that's kind of the legacy you want to live. And so 
asking him that question, you know, it might be that he's perfectly fine being who he is and you aren't. And it's your energy and your push that's trying to make him into something he has no desire to be. And so that's really a waste of your energy. It's sort of like Jesus when he talked to the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler acted like he wanted to be a follower of God. Okay, mm -hmm. I want to do this. And his, Jesus says, keep some hands. I've done that. Do this. I've done that. And then it, so he said, well, then give up all your money and come follow me. And that required a little bit more energy required a little bit more sacrifice. And he said, oh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to, I don't want to be that religious. I don't want to be that much of a Jesus follower. Mm -hmm. I want to just look like I'm a Jesus follower. I don't want to really have to do anything that costs me. Right. And then what did Jesus do? He let him go. Okay. I accept your decision of who you want to be. And, and it says Jesus loved him and let him go. Right. Mm -hmm. Try to, force him or guilt trip him or convince him or argue with him. He accepted where he wanted to be. And that wasn't with him. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think those are hard things for us to do, but they might be necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. End of the day questions are also important for me too. I'm sorry, Risa, for your diagnosis. That's, that's hard and scary when our, when we're getting at the end of the line or we're getting health challenges, we start thinking more about what is it? How do I want to be? How do I want people to remember me? What do mm -hmm. I want to stand for? What do I want to stand against? What's my legacy? And I, I, for me, ladies, I really want to help women, Christian women who've been stuck in unhealthy patterns and unhealthy relationships grow to be your best self. And I think that's where your work is required. It's not about just being married. It's about stewarding your life. And what kind of person do you want to be at the end of the day? Do you want to be an angry, cranky, bitter woman because your husband didn't like you, like, love you like you wanted him to? Is that who you want to be? Is that what you want marriage to produce in you? Just because mm -hmm. I stay married? <laughs> I mean, I think you have to really think about that. Yeah. And so, yeah. And that's your work to do. That's your work to do. In a hard marriage, in a good marriage, it's still your work to do. In no marriage, it's still your work to do. Yeah. And these questions are important, whether you're healthy and 20 or you're 80 and your health is failing, right? Where are you going? What is, what is your goal in life and what steps do you need to get there so that you're feeling proud of yourself, that you're having integrity about your life, that you feel aligned with God and his calling on your life, right? Yeah. That you don't have regrets. I should have, could have, would have, right? that you think about that now. All right, let's go to some other questions. My husband tends to take up all the space, or my husband seems to take up all the space. I don't know how else to describe it. His emotional needs are so deep and vacuous. He doesn't seem to be able to meet mine from his place of deficit, but it seems he will never be met. I've stepped back for five years, four years following a one-year separation. And while it's not as bad as it was, it's still painfully lacking. Not bad enough to go, not good enough to stay. I feel so stuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand exactly what you mean by that, taking up all the space, the emotional energy in the room, right? And it sounds like his needs are unending, maybe that he has a hole in his bucket, right? So no matter how much you put in his bucket, it just kind of floats off and his bucket is always empty. I think you have to really decide how much space are you, of, of yours are you going to allow him to take up? And how, how else are you going to get your needs met? If he's incapable, if he's always at a deficit, is that you're going to have needs too, and you're going to need support. And if this is feeling like a one-way relationship, it's not mutual, um, you're going to need support in your life. People who can hear you, listen to you, give you space, right, where it's reciprocal. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree with what Susan said. I think that it's time for you to ask yourself, what do I want? And it doesn't mean you have, to, here's where I want you to be really careful, ladies. Sometimes we think I want a different marriage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that may not be the best decision for you to make right now when you're so vulnerable because you might end up jumping from the frying pan into the fire. <laughs> 
right? So, so that's not your first next step, right? Your mm -hmm. first next step is to ask yourself, what do I want? What do I need? And so, and maybe, maybe I need to stop feeling so guilty that I can't make him happy, that I have to stop feeling so responsible to fill his bucket every day. It's exhausting. What do I need? I need some friends. I'm going to go find some girlfriends. I need some activities that bring life to my spirit. I'm going to go hiking. I'm going to join a hiking club. I'm going to join an art club. I'm going to join a knitting club. I'm going to join a Bible study. I'm going to get involved that I'm not so accessible that he thinks I'm just waiting around to give him his needs met, you know, that I've got my life to live. And then as you're doing that, as you're building your strength, as you're building your support system, as you're building your character, as you're talking with God, as you're growing as a woman, as a person, as a uh, God's daughter, then you have more wisdom to decide what we're going to do about us. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's the order of things. You know, when, when you're not sure about us, we could feel anxious, right? I'm not, us is not okay. And the, in the webinar, we're going to talk about what's my problem. What's his problem. What's our problem because it's all different and us isn't okay here. Right. Mm -hmm. He's got a problem. Us has a problem, but you have a problem too. And that you're kind of wandering, not sure what to do because we have put all of our eggs in one basket as Christian women. And that is wife and mom. Mm -hmm. But there's more baskets out there, ladies. And even if the wife or the mom basket is unhappy or empty, there is other baskets you can fill. Abigail is a wonderful example of that. She's described as a beautiful, intelligent woman. She was a resourceful. The Proverbs 31 woman had lots of baskets in her life, not just her marriage. And her marriage was a good marriage, but she had lots of other baskets. What other baskets do you have in your life besides your marriage that are important to you, that are life-giving, not life-draining? So I shared yesterday an exercise that I do with myself, and I do it pretty regularly, but I did it religiously for about, I, I actually hired a guy to help me, a spiritual director to help me, because I never heard of this exercise before. But he, I was drained, I was depleted, I was angry, because everybody was sucking the life out of me. That's kind of how I pictured it, you know, and he said, you're letting them. And what are you doing to recharge your battery? And I'm like, I don't have time to recharge my battery. You know, I was talking like some of you talk, and I understand, because I've been there. And he said, every day I want you to sit and I want you to sit in a space that you love. And so I had a swing out in my back porch and I'd sit there and he'd say, I want you to ask yourself, what do I need? What brings life to my spirit and what drains me? And I would write it down. And then every day, ask yourself at the end of the day today, what brought life to your spirit and what? Mm -hmm. And those questions. And I kept a journal and I kept them probably about, about three months. And I noticed a pattern. I noticed a pattern of the things that energized me and brought life to my spirit and things that drained me. And yesterday I shared that one of the things that drained me was the weather, like cloudy, cold, <laughs> dreary winters. I was just like, I need a sun lamp. I'm like so exhausted, no energy, depressed. I need to move to Arizona. That's what I need. <laughs> you know, I need heat. I need sunshine. Yeah. You know, but it helped me to understand how crucial that was to spend three months just every day sunshine i sat in the window it felt so good right and understanding that birds nature fresh air those were life-giving every day i'm outside i sit outside i walk outside i need that for me to function right but you wouldn't have known that unless you took the time to ask yourself yeah i love that example and so i think that's great advice when you're feeling stuck take the time to dis describe your problem what is the greatest need that you have that's not getting met? Mm -hmm. And then you, you take one baby step towards that. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you're not in the same place anymore. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I resigned my job and transit. Um, Susan, are you okay with time? Yes, I need to leave before 1.30. Though. So okay. I've got another five minutes or so. Okay. I resigned my job and transitioned three months later because I could not continue to pastor and handle the dysfunction of my marriage. Husband is livid because he was at the church prior to my coming. I'm grieving the loss of my church family. Um, I'm not sure there's a question, but we're sorry. And grieve, take the time to grieve. Because grieving means that something mattered to you that you lost, right? And so that grieving is giving it honor that you mattered to me, whether it's a person or a job or a pet or a dream, and I, I've lost this. 
And so you're honoring and valuing that through your grief mm -hmm. and saying goodbye to that. And it's worthy to grieve. Mm -hmm. Definitely worthy to grieve. Mm -hmm. And then I think you can also validate. Not that, I don't know, you say he's livid. Uh, he's going to have some feelings too, mm -hmm. right? And you can validate. I know this is not what you want. And we have some decisions to make. I'm leaving the church. What do you hope to do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're two separate people, right? Yeah. Yeah. My husband does not seem receptive. So I'm going to let you answer this, Susan, because I know you have to go. My husband does not seem receptive when I try to talk about my needs. Is there hope that he will hear me and act on it one day? I feel like I'm stepping on eggshells. It does make, me, make it hard for me to communicate my needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like we, we sort of already talked about this a little bit, but what happens with, when someone else is not receptive? Do they get to decide? Your, your needs are not worth anything. What you want doesn't matter. Do they get to decide that? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, so what will you do about that so that you're upholding what you need instead of, of waiting for somebody else to validate that and give you what you need? What will you do for yourself to make sure that your needs are getting met? Mm -hmm. I think another question that you could ask your husband is not what, like, I have a need, you know, I need you to, you know, care about Christmas, or I need you to listen to me when I'm talking or whatever your needs are that he's ignored. I think the last kind of last ditch question might be a statement, not a question, but a statement about like this. And I'm going to give you the statement, you'll rephrase it, however, will be most helpful for you. And the statement is this, I'm observing something in our marriage that is really bothering me and I'm wondering if we could talk about it for two minutes so you're going to put your toe in the water you're going to give a time limit to it so that he doesn't feel like oh my gosh we're starting something that I don't want to finish and so you're going to give him the best shot of saying yes but if he says no then that answers it for you he doesn't want to hear you not he doesn't want to hear you about anything not just your needs but I've been thinking about something, I've observed something, and I'd like, it's a, it's a problem, I'd like to talk to you about it for two minutes or less, right? And make sure you honor that, that you can say what you need to say in two minutes. And then if he says yes, the next question is now a good time. If he says no, then the next question is when. Mm -hmm. If he says yes, then be prepared, right? I notice that whenever I talk about my needs or however you've done it before, whenever I say I need this or whenever I say this or whenever I've said that or whenever, it kind of falls on deaf ears as if I'm not important, as if I don't matter. That's the story I'm telling myself. And that's how I'm feeling in our marriage, that I'm not important, that my needs don't matter. Is that how you're feeling? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're not asking him to meet your need. You're telling him that you notice that he doesn't seem to care about your needs. And is that true? And depending on his, so if it's short, clear, concise, um, if he mocks you, if he makes fun of you, if he ignores you, if he uh, won't answer you, take that as a yes, you don't matter. You're there to serve him and that's it. And a lot of men have that view of marriage, that you're there to meet my needs. And maybe we've enabled that a bit in our overfunctioning, right? But now you know. So stop asking him because he has no intention and doesn't care about meeting your needs. So Susan's right. What do you do about your needs? It becomes defense. Yeah. And then that would be a second. So I notice that whenever I talk about touchy questions, you get really defensive. But this is this important that I think I need you to reflect on it and get back to me so that you calm yourself down and then get back to me because I'm feeling very unloved and unimportant to you. It's a powerful script. I see Jenna said she jotted it down. Yeah. I and this you recorded. Yeah, this is recorded. And if you catch your e if we have your email, you will get a, a notice that, you know, hey, Leslie did a Facebook live today. It's recorded. But you can also just go into Facebook and I think rewatch it. So if you want to, it's been we've been on for about an hour. You can just kind of fast forward it to that time and you'll know. Mm -hmm. OK, Susan, do you want to head off or do you want to try another question? 
Yeah, I'm going to drop off here, Leslie. Um, it's been good to see you and spend time. And I hope you all do join the uh, webinar. The link is right below us, lesliebernick.com forward slash join webinar. Leslie is so generous with her time. And I assure you, it'll be well worth your time. It's going to be meaty. It will be rich. And it might be three hours, but it won't feel like three hours because you'll be sad it's ending. Thanks, Susan. Appreciate you. All right. Yeah. Thanks. All right, I'm going to hang out for another half an hour since I was so late. Um, I'm going to hang out till um, 11 my time, whatever time it is yours. If it's, it's okay with you, if you're going to hang out with me, I'll hang out with you. Um, and so I will answer the questions and then we'll we'll go. Okay. All right. Um, how do I practice self-care in this divorce after 33 years? And now my husband, who's a narcissistic personality disorder, is seeking God and help. Working through his abuse, addiction, his own trauma, how can I support him well by caring for my own sanity and healing? All right, so you're divorced after 33 years of marriage, and now he wants. So you're divorced, okay. So I think you have to decide whether that's even your job to do at this point. And I'm not saying that callously. I'm saying that strategically and for both of your welfare. So you guys are used to a pattern in your dysfunctional marriage, whatever that pattern was. Usually if it's narcissism, let me grab my whiteboard because I want to draw this out for you because this will be really helpful. So this is a pattern and this is going to be important for all of you who are over-functioning. Okay, so if this isn't your particular question, the answer will help you. All right, so if we draw a line like this and we put it in the middle and if we think about this side as tending to be more selfish and this time tend to be more selfless which is what we've been talking about today i'm working so hard for other people's happy you know for me to get their happiness kind of thing so if we think about a healthy person so this would be this would be a positive one positive two not positive in terms of good but more and more <laughs> all right so this would be narcissism around here Okay, it doesn't mean people aren't selfish here, but they're not narcissistic. Selfless is here, negative two, negative three, less. Okay, so just as unhealthy as narcissism is, su sacrificial suffering for no good reason is also unhealthy. Living your life to please others is also unhealthy. Not having a life, not knowing what you want is unhealthy. It's not Christian virtue. All right, even though we've kind of called it that, it's unhealthy if you're here. OK, so our goal is to be sort of here. There's a place for healthy narcissism and saying, it's my birthday. <laughs> I kind of like to have some birthday cards or some birthday wishes or a party. It's my birthday or I'm in intensive care. No, I don't want you visiting me or asking me for anything right now. That's not selfish. It's healthy to stick up for yourself or have certain needs or have certain expectations of yourself. If you're in labor, or if you're sick, if you're, it's your birthday, you're not that way all the time. But in certain days, yes, you want to party, okay? And that's not being narcissistic, all right? Or you don't want to do something and that's not being selfish, right? So it's healthy to have a little bit of this and it's healthy to have some sacrifice and servanthood and all of those kind of things, as long as you can say no. What happens when this kind of person meets this kind of person and they get married, a narcissist actually looks for this kind of person because a narcissist couldn't get away with what he gets away with, with this kind of person or even this kind of person, all right? Because a narcissist needs this person to revolve their whole life around them. Right. So now you've divorced. So I assume that you're moving up the ladder here <laughs> that you're saying, ah, I don't think I'm going to do that anymore. I'm starting to get me healthy. Great. Great. And maybe he's moving down the ladder a little bit and he's starting to get himself healthy. Maybe, maybe not. You don't know. My fear in you taking any kind of management of his support or care is that you're going to slide back here. Right. And he will slide back there because that's what's typical that you've done together, right? So I don't know that you can be. And maybe the most healthy thing you can say to him at this point is I am so grateful that you are going for help and you are doing your work. And I will make a commitment to you to pray every single day for you that you stay strong in your journey. 
Maybe that's the most loving, sacrificial thing you can do for him without getting involved in his daily needs for support, right? Because I think it'll stir the old patterns too much for you. It's like going against the waves. It's exhausting. Um, and I think he needs to accept that as part of his growth. And you need to say that as part of your growth, all right? Um, and that would be my advice to you is don't get involved in his treatment or his care, um, but show a lot of appreciation and love and gratitude and support in prayer and pray for him every single day that God would bring other people in his life that can help him take that journey down to the normal range and you take that journey to the normal range. Okay. That would be my best answer for that based on what I don't know. Okay. If my husband does not seem receptive. Oh, I talked about that. All right. Uh, let's see. I am separated from my husband for the last five years. He left after I told him to sadly I had, um, I'm not sure of that word, Karen, N U R C abuse traits. So did my husband in very real ways. Is there hope to heal this marriage? So I'm not sure what that word is. And that word is important for me to be able to answer that question. So Karen, if you can look at the original one and put the right word in there, that would be helpful. Um, okay. All right. Sadly, I had narcissistic abuse traits. So did my husband in very real ways. Is there hope to heal this marriage? Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think God is is a God of miracles, but he doesn't make miracles out of people who aren't working at their healing. So he asked that man in John chapter five, do you want to be well? What a bizarre question. Who wouldn't want to be well? But I think there's a payoff sometimes to stay unhealthy, right? We get to be the victim. We get to blame everybody else for why our life isn't working. Um, there's some very real payoffs for staying unhealthy. So whether or not you and your husband are doing your work to get healthy. So let me just say this very quickly. An unhealthy person, which you say you are, and an unhealthy person who you say he is, cannot make a healthy marriage, <laughs> right? It, it doesn't happen. So the best chance to know whether or not this marriage can work is for you to do your work to get healthy and for him to do his work to get healthy. It's been five years. I don't know if either one of you have done that work, but if you haven't done that work, then there is no chance in the world that you can create a healthy marriage. You can get married, but you are not going to create a healthy marriage because an unhealthy person and a healthy person have a struggle being married, let alone two unhealthy people. So um, there's no statement in this that you have done any work for five years and no statement in this that he has done any of his work in five years. You've just lived separately. So if there's been a lot of work done and you can describe that and define that and the two of you interact differently and you can solve problems, you can manage your own feelings, you can you're self-aware enough to know what's going on and you can notice when you're getting worked up or you can notice that, hey, I'm being, you notice, narcissists don't notice that they're selfless, selfish, and unhealthy codependents don't notice that they're unhealthy. They don't notice that. And so part of the therapeutic or coaching work or the self-reflection work that you have to do is you have to notice, wow, I'm getting a little, I'm getting a little further back here than I want to be. It feels like I'm being selfish just by being healthy. And sometimes when you're with a narcissist and they haven't done their work, they'll tell you you're being selfish just because you're moving up this ladder a little bit because you're no longer willing to be totally selfless. So I don't know the work you've done. Uh, and so all I do know is that two unhealthy people cannot make a healthy marriage. So my, my answer would be probably that's not your first next right step. All right, let's see. My ex-husband and I share 50-50 custody of our three school-aged daughters. He is not in a healthy place emotionally and hasn't been for quite some time. He operates in extremes. He's manipulating, controlling their every move or neglecting their needs and treating them as if they are friends. Our daughters consistently return to me from his home, needing a lot of attention, acting entitled, disrespectful. I find myself over-functioning, trying to undo the damage inflicted during their time with him. And by the time of our time together, they're usually in a much healthier place emotionally but to the detriment of my own healthy, uh, my own health, physically, mentally, and emotionally. 
I am exhausted, but unsure how to give them what they need without overcompensating and giving it to the extent that I am. Can you offer any advice? I love that you asked this question. And I think it's a really important question to ask for moms who share custody with very unhealthy uh, dads. And I don't know how old your daughters are, um, but they must have some idea that two households are very different, right? Two parents are very different in their parenting styles. Um, and I think those words you can say without demonizing their dad or being guilty of, you know, alienating him from them as dad, uh, he can help probably do that all by himself. So I think this is, you know, kind of giving your children coping skills versus picking up the pieces of their emotions when they get back or overcompensating and comforting or indulging or trying to be the dad he wasn't for them isn't really going to serve them long term. It may stabilize them in the moment and comfort them, but not really serve them in the long term. So if they're school age children, you know, I'm not five, six and seven, but, you know, in fifth grade or sixth grade or above, I think it's time to say kind of that you live in two very different households. And if they've ever traveled much or if they've ever done anything, you could say, hey, if you if you lived in the United States half the time and you lived in communist Cuba half the time, you would experience life very differently in two different places. And you would have to there's two different kingdoms and there's different rules in each kingdom. And when you come to this house, these are the rules and I expect you to you know, obey them. And at dad, you know, house, I can't control dad's rules. That's why we're divorced. And dad has his own rules and his own way of being a dad. And I would give them the coping tools to start speaking up for themselves, start saying, I don't like that, learning to bond together and support one another. Because when dad is gaslighting the kids and the other kids later privately say, you know, that wasn't true. That's not how it happened. That helps. That that was our saving grace as three kids in a crazy woman's home growing up is that all of us talked and she was crazy to all of us. And so nobody felt gaslighted when their perceptions were, this isn't right and this isn't fair. We at least had our, our each other to help each other cope with what was going on. And so really helping them to be supportive of one another, of um, helping them to develop that conversation that they can have with one another when they're at dads of how we're gonna do and what we need to do and how can we support each other while they're there. And then applaud them for those efforts instead of you being the hero of rescuing them from a horrible weekend at dad's, how might they learn to rescue themselves from a horrible weekend at dad's? How might they learn to um, calm themselves down? How might they learn to set boundaries with, with dad or speak up with dad or, or, you know, just have other distractions so they're not so dependent on dad? they need food, can they bring food in their backpack? If they need medicine, can they learn to take their own medicine? If they have a cell phone, can they text you with a question if they have it, if dad's not available to ask? So those would be the things I would really be empowering your children, not necessarily just picking up all the pieces of the weekend. And that may give you more energy and give them more energy as they go there and then come home to you. Okay, those would be not knowing any of the details. Those would be my best ways to answer that. All right. My husband places his work, his family, then his broken marriage. We've been separated from one year. What are some boundaries I can have that will improve our marriage? Um, I think that's the wrong question because your husband has already said to you very loud and clear that your marriage is not a priority. So boundaries isn't going to improve it because he doesn't necessarily want to put any energy in improving it. So his problem is he prioritizes other things other than you. Your problem is you don't like it. What do you want to do about your problem? Because you can't make someone prioritize you. You can't make someone love you. You can't make someone want to be married to you. So what's your problem and what do you want to do about your problem? You're sad, you're heart sick, you're grieving. Those are good things to understand that you must do and maybe you need to let go that you're saying to me loud and clear. You don't want to be married. I accept that. I still love you. I'd be willing to work on our marriage, but I don't think that's what you want. And I'm going to live in truth and reality and not in what I wish it was. And that might be your answer, right? Not setting boundaries and forcing someone to love you or forcing someone to be with you or forcing someone to want you that you can't do that. Even Jesus didn't do that. And you can't do it. So as heartbreaking as it is, you might have to let it go. 
How do you relate with someone who treats you as an extension of themselves rather than a separate individual? Well, you have to start acting like a separate individual. And the first way that a child, so when a child is born, it doesn't see itself separate from the mother. So it doesn't see that you are a separate person. If any of you have been a mother, most of you have, you understand this, that from birth to about 18 months, a child, you know, I mean, they don't even think about you as a separate person. They cry, you come. They don't think, oh, mom's tired. I shouldn't cry right now. They don't think that at all. It's not even in their brain waves to think that way. But when they begin to discover that they're a separate person, usually when they can walk and talk a little bit, what's the first word that comes out of their mouth when they are not mama and dada, but what's the first word that comes out of their mouth of a child who begins to realize they are a separate person? What's the first word? Yep. No, that's how you begin to show you're a separate person. <laughs> All right. Simple. No, I don't like that. Nope. I don't want to do that. Nope. I'm not going there. Nope, I don't want that. That's how you start to say. And then when they start to like, what? Say, we're different. I don't think the same way you think. I don't want the same things you want. No, I don't want that. That's how you begin to individuate. And a, a two-year-old knows how to do it. An 18-month knows how to do it. You can do it. You just forgot how to do it because you were interested in making sure they were always liking you, right? But a child who's learning, oh my gosh, I don't have to eat these green beans. No. I'm not going to eat them. It's pretty powerful. It's pretty powerful when you have your no. Sadly, Christian women, especially wives, have been told you're not allowed to have your no. And we've believed it. And it's not true. God never says that. He gave Adam and Eve their no. Very first decision they made. They said, I don't think we're going to believe you, God. We're going to believe the serpent here. And uh, we're going to do what he says. Right? No. And I'm not saying no is always the best choice. But you have a choice to make. And you can say no. And that's what says I'm different than you. I don't think like you. I don't want what you want. I don't have the same convictions you have. I'm a separate person. Okay. I neglected myself for so many years. I now feel like I am over caring for myself. How do I biblically balance the resolve to take care of myself while also not feeling guilty that I'm practicing self-care? Yeah. Um, and this is similar to the next question. If I'm so bummed out from years of overfunction and self-neglect, what are some steps to heal? So I don't, so I think we need to think of the difference between self-care and self-comfort and self-indulgence. All right. So sometimes we say, oh, I'm going to eat this box of cookies because I need to take care of myself. I mean, that's more self-comfort. It comforts you temporarily, but it's not really in alignment with who you want to be if you want to be a healthy person, right? Um, so so self-comfort is okay sometimes, but it's not the same as self-care. So I don't feel guilty at all every single day I take a shower. Never would I let anybody make me feel guilty for taking the time to take a shower, brush my teeth, put my makeup on. Every single day I do that, it takes 45 minutes. Every single day I walk 10,000 to 12,000 steps. Takes me about an hour, an hour and a half sometimes, right? Depending on the weather and what I'm doing, right? I, that's my self-care. I must do that in order to recharge my battery. It's like you can only drive an electric car so long or a car so long before you got to put gas in it. So you know what you can do and what you need for self-care. I need eight hours of sleep every night. That's not negotiable. I need eight hours of sleep in order for me to talk and function and my brain to work in a way that can give to others. So I need to read my Bible every day. There's certain things that I must do. I need order in my home. I have to take care of my home. I don't feel guilty for doing my dishes and cleaning up my home. I, I need order to function. And that's not selfish. We don't even think of it as selfish. So wherever we got the idea that taking care of ourselves, stewarding my mind, my heart, guard your heart above all else for this wellspring of life. Who does that for you, friend, if you don't? This is self-care. Jesus took care of himself. He went away to a quiet place to get away from the noise sometimes. He did go to sleep. And he did get up. He walked everywhere. He was never in a hurry. He didn't let other people's agenda control him. He prayed regularly. 
Is that all selfish? No, it was self-care. It's self-stewardship. So I think if you've been used to seeing that as selfish, um, you may just have to tell yourself, it's okay. I'm not being selfish. I'm not demanding everybody cater to me. I'm not demanding everybody do it my way. I'm just taking care of me and I know what I need to do to take care of me. And when you're sick or you're in recovery, it might take longer for your self-care. So if I was in chemo, I would not be doing these Facebook lives because I probably wouldn't have the energy. If I were um, recovering from surgery, I wouldn't be working like I'm working now, right? I would be taking more care of me so that I could heal to serve, right? So, so if you're in healing from a destructive marriage or grieving from a loss of your marriage, um, be kind to yourself. Be kind to yourself that yourself need some time without the demands of work or people pressures to do stuff. And don't feel guilty about it. They may not like it. They may guilt trip you. But you only feel guilty when you let it, when you believe them. Like, oh, I'm bad for sleeping eight hours. I should only sleep six. I could get more done. And then you're a crabby mom and a cranky person because you didn't get your eight hours sleep. Is that how you want to show up? Sleeping is so important. I just finished a book on the importance of sleep. And one of the things I learned that I didn't know that I think makes a whole lot of sense is that every night, it's just like that recharging of the battery. If you don't chug, plug in your cell phone at night, it's just not going to work the next day. If you don't sleep a good eight hours, um, your brain, the prefrontal cortex, which is your rational thinking brain, this part of your brain right between your eyes, gets a new rewiring back to the back of your brain, which is the amygdala brain, which is your reptilian brain, the reactive brain, the brain that is fight or flight, which many of you are if you've been traumatized and you have been. Um, so this part to this part gets a kind of a new fresh coat of, coat of neurons or a fresh coat of something every night. And if you don't sleep well that night, guess what happens? You're much more reactive the next day. You feel less stable the next day and compound that day after day after day. And then you wonder, I'm mentally ill. Maybe you're not mentally ill. Maybe you're sleep deprived and you're not giving yourself enough rest to function properly. So I think that answers the question. Um, if I'm burned out from years of overfunction and self-neglect, I would do sleep, eat, Exercise as your non-negotiable first steps. Eat, sleep, eat well, eat healthy. You know what that is. We just don't do it, but you know what it is. Sleep eight hours, get a good night's sleep. And exercise aerobically for your body. It definitely staves off some mental health issues. It helps you recharge your battery. It helps you clear out the clutter, the emotional junk. Just like we take out our garbage every day, we don't want to let it accumulate in our house. Exercise flushes some of that energy, anxious energy, negative thinking out of your body's cells and helps them to cleanse out that way. So those would be three non-negotiables that I would say are really important for every human being. Then I think sitting and asking yourself some other questions like I did for a good three, four months. What do I need? What lights me up? So I went back to painting because I love painting. I'm painting my elephant back there. See him? Um, what lights me up? What makes my heart sing? What drains me? What depletes me? Chaos, technology, too much news. I can't listen to it. I have boundaries around all that, right? But other things I love and I nature, hiking, knowing what fills your tank is important. Now, can I do that every single day? No, but I do plan for it. I do plan for it. Some of you have been with me for a while. You'll see a paint, the same painting up there for six months because I haven't gotten to it. But eventually I get to it and I get it done. I got my old lady done. Do you want to see her? Some of you haven't seen her. Let me grab her. I'm in my shorts. I'm going to go play pickleball later. But uh, here's my old lady. Finally finished her. Those of you who saw her last year when she had crooked eyes. What I want, let me just talk about her for a minute. So I was starting her and her eyes didn't match. One eye was further here and somebody on Facebook Live said, oh, you know, put her over here. So here's this lady who's beautiful 
And I wanted her radiance to show this older woman whose beauty is fading on the outside and she's getting more and more beautiful on the inside. That's how I want to get old. That's how I want to get old. So as we're thinking about ourselves and the painting is a great illustration. I made tons of mistakes. I'm making tons of mistakes on the elephant. And then I just redo it. <laughs> I just redo it. And so for those of you who saw my mistakes and the last time I was on Facebook Live and you saw the old lady with the crooked eyes and all of that, and I made lots of mistakes on this picture. And yet the end turned out well. Why? Because I stuck with it and I kept learning. I stuck with it and I kept learning. And so this is the process of our life. So those of you who are saying, all right, I, you know, I did it wrong this way and I've got to figure out how to do it. Okay. Get yourself a mentor, get yourself a teacher. I have someone online I watch, just like you're watching me. I have an artist that I follow online that I watch. And get yourself someone who can give you some tips on how to stick with it, fix your mistakes, stick with it, learn some more, stick with it, fix your mistakes, learn some more, practice, practice, practice. And as you do that, you will move forward. That's what self-care is. It's tending your fires. You don't let your flames go out. In the webinar, I'm going to, I don't know if I'll sing it myself, but we're going to sing this little light of mine because we let our embers go out. And Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Don't let your embers go out. Don't let someone put your light out and don't neglect your own flame. That's the worst thing you could do for your one precious life. So I think there's one more question and then we're going to be done. Two questions. My husband got connected with a widow who he feels he became an emotional support of and helps her navigate with her two adult boys. My question is, how do I enforce the boundary that I don't like it? That's not a boundary. I don't like it isn't a boundary. It's a statement. And you are allowed to say, I don't like it. Um, and you have absolutely no control over him and what he does, even as your husband. All right. So usually in a healthy marriage, when you say I'm uncomfortable with something, I don't like that. A spouse listens and you negotiate and talk about it. Maybe she becomes one of your friends or you help her too. Or he says, you know, I'm going to forward you to someone else in the church or however that happens. But your husband's saying, hey, my relationship with this widow right now and my desire to help her is more important than your feelings of you don't like it. So you've told him your feelings. So let me just quick give you a quick lesson on a boundary. I'm trying to think of the fastest way I can do that. A boundary is about you. What you will do, what you won't do. What you do like, what you don't like. What you will tolerate, what you won't tolerate. So if my husband is smoking, I can't put a boundary around him and say, you cannot smoke. If your husband's watching porn, you cannot put a boundary around him. You cannot watch porn. Give me your computer. Give me your passwords. I'm not. That's treating someone like a child. It's controlling them. And I don't support control in marriage, whether a wife does it to a husband or a husband does it to a wife. You're not the boss of him and he's not the boss of you. And you're not going to control what he does. Right now, when you marry someone, you make some promises that I will allow you to influence what I do. And we will talk about it. But you don't make promises that you can control what I do. So this word boundary is about you. It's not about them. So boundaries help define you. I don't have any property lines around my house, but we have boundaries. I take care of my house. That's my house to take care of. I don't take care of my neighbor's house. It's not my responsibility, right? So boundaries help us define what's mine to take care of, what's yours to take care of. My life, my body, my health is mine to take care of. Stewarding me is mine to take care of. Your health, your body, your mind, your, your faith is yours to steward. Now, when you have littles, there's some crossover there, but you're not responsible to steward your husband's body or mind or heart or spirit. You're responsible to steward yours. That's where we get mixed up. When you start trying to fix his problem, you're not responsible. Doesn't mean you can't help if they want you to, but you're not responsible because you have no power to do it. You have no power to stop your husband from watching porn or visiting this widow. So a boundary is about what you will do and what you won't do. So if someone's smoking, I could have a boundary and saying, hey, I won't be in your presence when you smoke. It bothers me. 
So if you choose to smoke, I'm going to go in another room. I'm going to go outside. I'm not even going to live with you if you choose to smoke in the house because I don't want to smell it, right? So those would be my boundaries. Now, boundaries take a cost. You know, if I have to live somewhere else, that's, that's, that's a cost. But I can't make someone not smoke. I can say, you may not drive with me. I will not allow you to smoke in my car. If you want to smoke, drive separately. Or if you want to drive your car, I'm going to drive separately because you want to smoke in your car. So I will steward me. Those are my boundaries. I'm responsible for me. So with, with respect to the widow, you decide whether this is a deal breaker in terms of a boundary, but you can't set a boundary on him. All you can say is, hey, I don't like it. And more than that, I'm really unhappy that I, my feelings and my wisdom here don't matter to you more than your care for this widow. What does that say about our marriage? Those are important questions to ask him, but the boundary word would be inappropriate and it's not, um, you can't set a boundary on him, okay? So those, I hope that answers that. Um, I have been separated, one last question, for eight months, married 35 years, see same patterns in our relationship now as then. How do I go forward? <clears throat> Do your own work. Do your own work. We get so caught up in how do I save the marriage? How do I save him? How do I fix them? Do your own work. You have some work to do if you've been married for over 35 years, whether it's healing work, whether it's growing work, whether it's clarifying work, whether it's learning how to steward yourself work, you have plenty of work to do on you right now. If you're in a situation where you're in danger, uh, while you're separated and danger would mean bigger danger than just, I'm not, you know, physically harming you. But the biggest problem I see for women who are separated for eight months, who've been married for a long period of time is financial danger. So you may be in some financial danger right now that you might want to consult with an attorney about um, because every state is different. Every state has different laws, but when you're married, um, and separated is still married. When you're married in the law's eyes, not necessarily morally, but in the law's eyes, when you're married, they don't have anything to do with your finances unless you're doing something illegal, like not paying your taxes or money laundering or something like that. But what you do with your money is your business as long as you're married. However, once you file for divorce, then the law says, ooh, this couple isn't together anymore. And now we have some laws around what you do with your money while you're separating the marital assets or while you're divorcing, right? And so there's some rules around that. Like when you're getting a divorce, you can't just take your whole IRA and go take it and put it in a Swiss bank account, or you can't drain your whole IRA and give it to a prostitute. Um, that's not okay. You can't take a second mortgage on your house that your spouse doesn't know about while you're getting divorced. So, but what happens in this legal limbo land of separation, you're still married unless you have a legal separation and most states don't have that anymore. So in the law's eyes, you're still married. So while you're separated, the most danger I see women naively being in is assuming that whatever financial assets you have are still intact. When in fact, some husbands, not all, but some husbands use this separation period as a time to liquidate and hide assets. So that when you do finally file for divorce, if that's what you choose to do, you will have a very hard wake up call that there's no money left anywhere, that the house has got a second mortgage on it, that there's no money in the bank accounts, that there's no money anywhere. And then it costs you a boatload of money to hire a forensic attorney and a forensic accountant to find out what happened to it. And even if you do find out what happened to it, they assume that that was a joint decision as long as you're still married. So, and I think this is a place that the church has been very neg negligent, especially the more conservative Christians where they say, okay, if he's abusive, you can separate, but you can't divorce. Well, it puts you in a horribly dangerous place financially, especially for those of you who have assets or you've been married any length of time, that the last thing that you want to do is find out at, you know, 65 years old that your retirement and his retirement are all squandered and there's nothing left in the bank and you've got to go get your job. So go get a job to support yourself or go live with your kids. That's the last thing that you want to do. So I would say for you right now, um, how do you go forward is that you consult with an attorney and that you not file for divorce, but you consult with an attorney and find out what the laws are in your state regarding financial assets, especially if you have them. 
and how might you protect them while you're still in this legal limbo land with separation and not sure what you're going to do with your marriage. But um, if you see the same patterns and there's been no work done, then two unhealthy people or even one healthy person and one health unhealthy person cannot make a healthy marriage. That doesn't mean people don't do it. They get married, but it's a boatload of heartache. Um, and so you have to decide what you want to do with that. All right. So whew, we've been going a long time. Let me tell you when our next Facebook live is. It is, I think, tomorrow afternoon. So not afternoon, afternoon for me, evening East Coast time. So we're going to do it tomorrow evening. Let me just find the topic. Hold on. So it's going to be tomorrow at 7, at 8, 7 30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and we've kind of covered it a little bit today. Uh, we'll cover it in more depth, the guilt parts. So how do we how do we speak up for ourselves and do our self-care without apologizing when someone's disapproving of us? And how do we navigate the guilt as we are embracing our self-care? Now, we have touched on that some today, but I think it's a huge problem for many of you. Um, and again, we want to look at self-care as self-stewardship. We are called to steward our one precious life. We're not called to just live recklessly or live mindlessly. You know, the Bible says, take heed of yourselves. Where are you going? What are you doing? What are you thinking? That takes time to figure all that out. And I'll bring some tools tomorrow that will give you, I'll kind of give you the tools of that exercise that I did. And I'll give you some tools tomorrow to help you do the deeper work of some of the like, who am I and what do I stand for? And, and the, all that with boundaries. We'll talk some more about that in detail uh, for you so that you can do that. And when other people will mock you or make fun of you for doing it or ask you what you're doing, why are you doing that for? Why are you wasting time? How do you navigate that? Like, they're sh shooting guilty arrows at you. Bad girl, bad girl, bad girl, bad girl. You're wasting time. And you're like, oh, what do I do with that? So we'll talk some more about that too. Okay. All right. Good. So please, if you have not signed up, if you have found this hour helpful, even in the Q&A, this is what our webinar is like, although it's much more teaching. I'm teaching. We're not just having a conversation. I'm teaching you for a good, like I said, 60 minutes concepts. And for you to get really clear, you have a workbook that you can take notes on it so that you have it for later. And then we do a whole Q&A. So you really do want to show up live, if at all possible. I know some of you work full time. That's why we do it two times during that same day. It's a long day for me. Um, usually by the end of the night, I'm going hoarse because I've talked so long. But I love to do it because I love helping women um, grow into the person that God created them to be. If we read in Genesis where God created the human person that God created male and female in his image. He created them male and female. He didn't just create men in God's image. And we're just the appendage. We're just the add on to help the man. No, we're not. We are equal partners, co laborers, joint heirs with Christ. That doesn't make us over anybody, but it doesn't make us under anybody either. And because we've lived, most of us have lived in a pretty, and I'm not talking about the church necessarily, just the culture is pretty patriarchal. Um, the patriarchal point of view, which was in the biblical times, didn't mean God endorsed it, but it's the way it was. It's the way it's always been, is that the man is always at the head and the woman is always at the foot or at the bottom or somewhere in the middle. And, and so that's not how God's order was. And again, it's not to be you know, brazen and bully and I'm better than you, anything. It's just that I want you to know your worth and your value. You weren't created as an animal. You were created as a human being, equal and just as valuable and important as a man. And men don't have a problem with knowing that. Women have much more of a problem knowing that. So I want you to know that and feel that inside because it makes a big difference in your relationships when you know who you are. All right, see you tomorrow. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye.